This is a presentation in two parts. It's going to begin with a chronology on my history of hyperbaric oxygen therapy and chronic traumatic brain injury and PTSD, and specifically blast-induced chronic traumatic brain injury and PTSD. The second part of this is a uh, repeat presentation of a scientific abstract I presented at the 8th World Congress on brain injury, which is on the computer here. And so to start, I, I wanted to say that um, all of this began for me with treatment of our divers with brain decompression sickness in the late 1980s. And effectively what we found was that we were not getting the same results the U.S. Navy was. It was a simple problem though. The bubbles had long gone through the brains of these divers and by the time we would see them from the Gulf of Mexico and then travel by land, we were often hours to days from the time of the accident. What we in fact were treating were the residual effects of the bubble passage, which were micro strokes in the brain. So in effect, we were treating subacute and chronic brain injury. Simultaneously, my senior partner, Dr. Keith Van Meter and Dr. Sheldon Gottlieb had a small grant from the Hirsch Foundation to study hyperbaric oxygen in Louisiana boxers who had been brain injured. And so as I was studying our divers, the boxing program or, or a project fell in my lap. By 1994, I had accumulated a series of uh, chronic traumatic brain injured patients and presented them at the UHMS meeting in Denver, Colorado. Uh, along with carbon monoxide poison patients and divers with chronic brain injury, it caused quite a bit of controversy, uh, to put it politely. Um, this work then launched uh, the perfusion metabolism encephalopathy study, where we decided to take Dr. Neubauer's original letter to the editor of Lancet, which showed that you could assess chronic brain injury with a SPECT brain blood flow scan, a single hyperbaric treatment, and a repeat scan. This became the basis for our investigation of essentially any chronic brain injury of any cause. And over the next five years, we accumulated a, a few hundred patients with cerebral palsy, autism, traumatic brain injury, stroke, uh, toxic brain injury, essentially 40 to 50 different neurological diagnoses. And uh, by 2000, we were now working on a stroke project. And uh, Dr. George Howard, who is the chairman of biostatistics at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, was uh, and is one of the foremost stroke epidemiologists in the United States. Dr. Howard uh, was one of our team members on this stroke project. He called up Dr. William Duncan in Representative Ernest Istook's office of Oklahoma. Um, Dr. Duncan uh, was in charge of legislative matters dealing with health care. Well, Dr. Duncan in the conversation found out that Dr. Howard was working with me and that I was treating chronic stroke and traumatic brain injury. Dr. Duncan immediately called and by January of 2001, I was treating one of his family members, an ex-Navy corpsman who had five traumatic brain injuries and was now disabled. Uh, substance abusing, living in a woman's basement, um, mainly because he was light sensitive. He had been fired from 13 jobs in 15 months and essentially was a young man whose life uh, was in ruins. Um, Dr. Brunk, Dr. Duncan brought this young man down and in January 2001 I began to treat him. He went into the chamber for his first treatment in the midst of a migraine headache and came out with a marked reduction in his headache. By the second treatment the following day, that was the last headache he has had in nine years. The treatment effect was so dramatic that Dr. Duncan did a number of things. In his legislative position, uh, he had considerable influence, but the first thing he did was secure an invitation for me to give a lecture to the National Institutes, uh, National Institutes of Health Neurological Divisions. And so in February of that year, I gave a presentation to all of these scientists and my single question was, please tell me what I'm doing wrong. Show me the error or the flaws in my scientific argument, in what Dr. Neubauer had been arguing, what I was now arguing, because I didn't want to waste a career on some fantasy uh, that was not grounded in science. 
At the end of an hour and 15 minute lecture, there was dead silence and I had to solicit questions from them. Nobody had anything to say to refute the science I put in front of them. Instead, they wanted to ask uh, about hyperbaric oxygen as a narrow window drug and if I wanted funding. Uh, I subsequently was encouraged to submit an application to the NIH and in 2004 I submitted an application to treat chronic traumatic brain injury and it was effectively rejected. Um, that, however, was three years down the road. And in the intervening period, what happened? By June of that year, Dr. Duncan had arranged meetings for me to visit with a variety of government agencies. The real impetus for it, however, didn't happen until I went and met with uh, the Hyperbaric Oxygen Therapy Committee of the Undersea and Hyperbaric Medical Society. In June of 2001, I presented the scientific argument for hyperbaric oxygen in acute severe TBI. Um, I showed that there was more evidence for this than nearly every one of the 13 indications on the quote accepted indications list. The Kahn argument uh, by Dr. Lynn Weaver uh, succeeded in rejecting this application. Uh, Dr. Duncan, a lay person with a lot of medical experience who had now seen this benefit in a family member that the U.S. Navy had offered a brain biopsy to before offering him a medical retirement, uh, was stunned and angered. And as a result, he, Ken Locklear, and I formed the International Hyperbaric Medical Association in June of 2001, immediately after the rejection of the UHMS's uh, a review of my application for acute severe TBI. Within a matter of a week to two weeks, I had meetings in Washington with the top representatives of Medicare and Medicaid, the FDA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Association, multiple divisions of the NIH, individuals from Walter Reed, uh, Bethesda Naval Medical Center, neurologists, government officials, and other agencies. Uh, and so on, including the Agency for Healthcare and Research and Quality. At the same time, I treated Dr. Duncan's other three family members, all of them with chronic traumatic brain injury residual, one of them retarded from that injury. All three of them had fairly dramatic improvements. You can read about it in a number of publications now. Um, what we also did in the subsequent few months after meeting with the director of CMS, we submitted on behalf of the IHMA the diabetic foot wound application in November 2001 and an application for acute severe TBI. The diabetic foot wound application was approved based on the scientific argument that I wrote that's on the decision memo on the CMS website. You can see that today. By the following year, I was in front of the House Appropriations Subcommittee and Dan Over uh, uh, in the following years, uh, Dan Burton's Oversight Committee presenting more of this information on hyperbaric oxygen and chronic brain injury and in autism. Well, unfortunately, we couldn't get um, um, results, and we tried to take this to another level. By January of 2004, we had a meeting at Walter Reed Army Medical Center where I offered to treat a group of the returning brain-injured Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans at my expense. I asked the military to test them before and after treatment and we would treat them in between to demonstrate that we could improve these brain injured veterans. Unfortunately, it was declined. As a result, I made an open pledge that subsequently appeared in USA Today, offering to treat a group of veterans for free to try to demonstrate to the military that we had a solution to what has become the most uh, significant problem in our military today. Dr. Duncan, had Duncan Hunter, the House Representative from San Diego, commission a meeting in his office where I was on the phone with representatives uh, from the Surgeon General's office of all of the military divisions, as well as a variety of other military medical officials to discuss instituting hyperbaric oxygen for battle casualties. Unfortunately, that didn't produce results. So we attempted to bring portable chambers with Steve Reimers to Camp Lejeune to treat wounded Marines who are now in wounded warriors' barracks. 
By 2006, that had uh, uh, been successful. And unbeknownst to us, the first brain injured casualty from Afghanistan was treated with hyperbaric oxygen, or I should say, uh, a brain injured casualty was the first one to be treated with hyperbaric oxygen. The reason he was treated, he was a brigadier general and state Florida judge. Uh, his name is General Pat Maney. Uh, general Maney was recruited by the ex-secretary of the Army, Martin Hoffman, who was Army Secretary under Gerald Ford. After being in Afghanistan for a period of time, General Maney was blown up. He was brain injured, sent back to Walter Reed, and for 10 months essentially wandered around Walter Reed, uh, unable to function. Cognitive rehabilitation had some improvement uh, uh, generated in uh, General Maney, but he was still uh, significantly injured until uh, his family friend, Dr. Eddie Zant, in Fort Walton Beach got the commanding officer through General Maney's wife um, to order my protocol uh, be delivered to General Maney. Um, General Maney subsequently received the 80 treatment protocol at Walter at uh, George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and is now back practicing law in Florida. When Martin Hoffman saw this change from effective judge and general to non-functional individual back to now functional judge, he was astounded and he joined our team.